Okay, so how is everyone today? Good? All right. So, as a reminder, there's an exam tonight. What? <laughs> so today's the 28th. So how did the other instructor te uh, treat you? Good? Uh, his name is Dr. Dahal. Uh, he was on, uh, good. Well, you know, it's hard to switch between, you know, you just get used to someone and then now you mix it all up, you know, it's hard. Uh, all right, so there's, uh, there's an exam tonight, you know, so don't, uh, don't, don't forget. Uh, also, uh, make sure that you know where your room is, right? Uh, so, like, you, you know, it's totally normal to have friends that are also in your class, but uh, that, that doesn't mean that necessarily that you're, supposed to, you're both supposed to go to the same room. Okay, so you need to make sure that you understand your room assignment and know where it is. It would be just completely silly to be walking around at 7 <laughs> trying to find your room when you're, when you're supposed to be taking the exam. Uh, good. So uh, the topic uh, that, uh, that we're on is uh, differential equations. All right. So uh, uh, Dr. Tahal told me that, uh, that uh, y'all covered uh, the exponential model. Yes? The, the population model, right. So let's uh, just briefly mention that so that we can kind of, uh, so, so that we can kind of uh, make sure that uh, we're all on the same page concerning how uh, we're speaking about it. Uh, so uh, generally the model, uh, the model is something like this. Uh, we could say, uh, so this is the exponential model. And then what, so the book says T, all right. So then uh, it uh, looks like this, dp, dt, is uh, kp. So now, uh, remembering that, you know, from, different, from uh, differential calculus, db, dp, dt, uh, under, understanding this to mean a rate, okay, so what this is saying is that uh, somehow we have a, a population p, A population P uh, changes in time T. So a population P is changing in time uh, with rate proportional to. Uh, the population's current size. And uh, the constant of proportionality uh, is K. <clears throat> now, uh, in principle, k can be uh, negative, zero, or positive, but uh, the, the, the case where k is zero is kind of, kind of trivial, right? Because then it's dp dt is, uh, would be zero. So that, that would mean that uh, the, the population is, not is, in fact, not changing at all. OK. So, uh, so there's, there's, there's several examples of this. Uh, an example is uh, literally just a human population, OK? So like uh, if you go back. Uh, in time, you know, and uh, or you know, make an estimate for the number of folks that were around, uh, say like in 1900. Now I don't know the exact numbers, but uh, I think it was on the order of two billion folks alive about a hundred years ago. And then uh, how many folks are alive now? Over seven billion, around seven and a half, right? So then we're getting, uh, uh, you know, as a population, we're we're increasing. And uh, here's the deal: is that um, uh, surely not everyone uh, has offspring, but uh, on average, on average, you can say, you know, how many how many children on average does someone have? And uh, in the in the uh, in the United States, on average, uh, a, a woman will have 2.1 children. Okay, obviously not, you know, not not really 0.1. You know, that doesn't make any sense. But on average, okay, 2.1. Uh, so uh, what that means is that, uh, you know, 
what that means is that, uh, you know, because about half the population is um, male and about half the population is female, uh, 2.1 uh, babies per woman, in the end, means that uh, the United States population is growing. Okay, but you can, you can consider other places. Uh, for example, uh, in Japan, the number of babies born uh, per woman, per lifetime, is, uh, well, at least, I don't know what it is today, but uh, historically it's been something like, uh, like 1.3, meaning, uh, meaning that the majority of, of women in Japan have uh, one child. Okay, some of them have two. Uh, now, because women constitute half the population, and because uh, w women are not uh, in Japan are having less than two children, what does that mean about Japan's uh, population? It's decreasing. Okay, so that that idea, those ideas, those are called you know population de demography. Okay, so then uh, the United States has uh, has population growth, and uh, uh, Japan has population decline. Of course, there's a lot of things be being unsaid, like uh, immigration and what have you. Okay. Uh, another, uh, but, but the thing to note about that is that, uh, is that uh, in 1900, about 2 billion folks, uh, then you could figure out how many, uh, how many say exactly uh, on 1900, the clock turns, uh, how many, how many uh, living, living people are in childbearing age. You know, not too young, not too old. Okay, that's some amount. And then you could calculate that exact same thing right now. How many folks are childbearing age that are not too young, not too old? Which one is, uh, is more? The, ones in the, 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 the number of folks in 1900 or the number of folks, folks now? Now, right? Now, so that, that means that, uh, that, means that uh, in 1900, there were babies being born all the time. And right now, there's babies being born all the time. But at the present time, there's more, the ba babies are being brought into the world more frequently, uh, more, rap more rapidly than in 1900. In the end, the reason is because the population increases according to its current size. Right? The bigger the population gets, the faster it grows. Okay? Just because there's more, there's more folks that are available to be making babies. It's just, it's just that, uh, that simple. So. <clears throat> All right, so that's what it means. The population grows in proportion to its current size. Uh, but that's if, uh, that's if K is positive. That's if K uh, happens to be positive. Because remember that uh, concerning related rates, uh, when, when a derivative is positive, that means that this quantity P is, is increasing, right? And when K is negative, that means that uh, the quantity is decreasing. Okay, so uh, some examples here, just to give some examples. If K is positive, <clears throat> if K is positive, uh, this could be something like uh, population growth. Mm, for example, human population. Uh, if K is zero, if K is zero, uh, that would indicate uh, no growth at all. So that so you can just imagine like uh, you could just look at a rock and say, "Hey, that rock's growing exponentially." With with k is zero, it's not a very clever thing. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. Right. It, it, it tells you that the population is changing in proportion to its current size. And then if k is negative, uh, this would uh, uh, be something like decay. So a prototypical example of decay is, uh, well, you could imagine. Uh, what if, what if uh, right here, I had a block, a kilogram of uranium. Uh, that, that would be extraordinarily unsafe. But uh, Im imagine that uh, we have, you know, I've got a block here of uranium-232, uh, uh, 235, better. Uh, so I've got a block of one kilogram of, of uranium-235. And then if we patiently sat here and just watched it, 
after 93,000 years, we'd still, have a, we'd still have a kilogram of material, but uh, only half of it would be uranium-235. The other half would have decayed to, uh, to, to other elements. Eventually, <laughs> after an extreme amount of time, it would all become uh, iron. Okay, but in the, in the relatively short term, that is to say only a few million years, they would be lead. <laughs> yes? Could this also show a type of uranium that would reveal all of the particles? Yeah, for example. So uh, an example is that uh, you can take uh, igneous rock, that is to say lava, you know, that uh, has cooled and, and it makes rocks and it's never been opened before. Uh, then you can, you, can, uh, you can figure out, okay, you can calculate the ratio of how much uranium is there versus how much lead is there, and you can figure out how many times, according to that ratio, how many half-lives must that have gone through, okay? So then, uh, for example, if, if, uh, if you start out with one kilogram of uh, uranium, uh, and uh, then you, and we go through one half-life, how much, how much uranium is there? Half a kilogram, right? If we go through two half-lives, how much uranium? Quarter. A quarter, right? Because it would be half of half. And then uh, if we go through three half-lives? An eighth, right? An eighth, an eighth, uh, a half, half, half. That'd be an eighth. So the ratio of uh, uranium to lead in this rock that's been contained, no one's, got, no one's messed with it. If you find that the ratio of uranium to lead is one to seven, meaning one part of uranium for seven parts of lead, that would mean that uh, we're looking at something that's gone through three half-lives. So you, you would have every reason to believe that, uh, that this rock is, in fact, on the order of 300,000 years old. So using that kind of analysis tells us, you know, we can take rocks and we can break them, we can break them open and look uh, anywhere on, on the Earth, and uh, we, we can find uh, that, uh, well, not just anywhere. It has to be old rocks. You find old rocks, and uh, those rocks tell us that the, the Earth is, in fact, uh, about, uh, what, like 4.3 billion years old, which means that, uh, the, that uranium has gone through, you know, however many half-lives is, is necessary. Interesting. So decay, and so the typical example is uh, radioactive decay. So uh, this, is, uh, this is pretty easy to... S uh, this kind of thing is uh, fairly easy to solve, uh, and uh, I'll do even do even a different one. So uh, if if this object again is like uh, super hot, so it's like really really heated, uh, and I just put it here, and it's in the room, okay, and the room is room temperature, then uh, then uh, and and assuming that the air conditioner maintains the room at room temperature, then uh, this object's temperature will uh, fall slowly to, uh, to room temperature, okay? And the rate, at which it, the rate at which its temperature falls is proportional to the difference between how, uh, of the room temperature and this temperature. Okay, similarly, if this was, uh, you know, like uh, frozen, like I just pulled it out of liquid nitrogen and just set it there, then it'd be super cold, and it would warm up to room temperature, and the rate at which it warms is proportional to the difference between the temperature of this object and the temperature of the room. No, I mean the difference. Like if, if, if the room, say, for just to make it easy, if this room was at zero Celsius and this was at uh, negative 200 Celsius, then, uh, then that, the difference would be 200 and it would be warming quite rapidly. And then when, when this thing got to be, say, negative 30 Celsius and the room is still zero, then the difference would be 30 and it would still be warming, but not as fast as it was before. Good. So an example of this. Uh, an example problem like this is something like this. We could say, uh, how about, um, so dp, uh, well, let's just, let's not even do an example. Let's just solve it because it's so easy. So dp dt uh, is like this. So what we can do is uh, to solve this differential equation is we can separate the variables. So we've got uh, variables p and t. And uh, in the first place, we can look at it in the differential point of view. So d, uh, dp is kp dt. And uh, what, uh, what I uh, would like to accomplish is I'd like to get, uh, well, k is not a variable. It's a constant. 
I'd like to get uh, all the P's on one side and all the T's on the other side. So can we do this? How can we do it? Divide by P, right? So uh, I could write this as uh, 1 over P dP is K dT, like so. Okay, so then now this is, this is called a separation. So the variables are separated because all the P's are on one side and all the T's on the other. And from here we can anti-differentiate. This is easy enough. So uh, what is the antiderivative of 1 over p dp? Log absolute p. And then what is the, uh, the antiderivative of uh, kdt? Kt. kt. And now we need a constant. So kt plus some constant. Now, uh, the, way, the way your problem will be set up, uh, it'll, it'll be set up such that uh, uh, for, for one reason or another, the P that you're dealing with is either going to be uh, always negative or always positive, in the same kind of sense that, uh, in the, same kind of sense that uh, uh, the amount of uranium, if you're tracking that, is, is always going to be a, a non-negative amount. Right? You're, ne you're never going to have a negative amount of uranium. Whereas if you're tracking something like, uh, say, uh, pH, right? pH can be negative, right? I'm trying to remember. <laughs> so in that case, you know, uh, in that case, you know, it, it, the, the variable could be negative. All right. So then now solving. It's been a while since I've thought about that. <laughs> so uh, we can, uh, how do we get the log to switch sides? Exponential, right? So when log changes sides, so from this side to that side, it's, it's a function on this side, it's a function on that side. So what I'm saying, we don't usually write it like this. So log, <laughs> everybody's stuck on pH. I never should have said anything. So when log changes side, it changes to exponential. Of course, we do, in this class, we usually don't write exp. Usually, usually we write e. So I'll, so I'll write that. So absolute uh, P is exponential of KT plus C. Now, because of, um, because of uh, exponent rules, I can, uh, I can take that C out and write this. I can write exponential of C multiplied by exponential of KT like that because of exponent rules. And then for various reasons in the various problems you'll deal with, it'll be the case that P's uh, gonna maintain its sign. Uh, but, uh, you know, sort of ignoring that, uh, you could say that uh, the solutions are either going to be P is negative that, negative exponential of C, multiplied by exponential of KT, uh, or P is exponential of C multiplied by uh, exponential of KT. Now here's the deal. C is some arbitrary constant, uh, right? So it's the, it's the anti-differentiation constant. And then when you take, when you take a, a real number and you compute its exponential, then the result is positive, right? Even if, even if C is negative. So like exponential of 10 is, is some positive number. Exponential of 0 is 1. What's the exponential of negative 10? Well, isn't it the case that uh, like exponential of, of negative 10, that's what I'm asking about, how can we write this with a positive exponent? One over, One over that, right? So exponential of 10 is some number, right? It's some positive number. So 1 over that is also positive. So what I'm telling you is that uh, when you take any real number you, ca you care to imagine, compute its exponential, the result is positive. Okay, so, so, so if, it, if it were this one alone, that would be saying that... Uh, exponential of c could be, in fact, any positive number. And uh, if it were this one alone, then that would be saying that uh, negative exponential of c could be any negative number. Okay? So taking them all together, what this is saying is that uh, the solution must be uh, p is equal to, uh, what are, they don't write it in the book. So uh, this will be, a is a good one, that's what usually is, exponential of kt. So that's the solution for some A. All right.
So now, uh, I want to make it clear, what, it, what does it mean to be a solution? So that's the solution to the exponential model. <coughs> so uh, note, uh, I want you to plug in p equal to a multiplied by exponential kt uh, into dp dt is kp. Now I'll plug it in there. So uh, remember that uh, that uh, dp dt, a synonym for that, a synonym for that is uh, to say ddt of p, right? That's what that means. So knowing that, if we take uh, dp dt, then uh, according to that, according to that, uh, I can put, I can replace that p with uh, a exponential kt. Right? So that's dp dt. And this is equal to uh, k p, but I'm going to replace that p with what? With that. So k a exponential k t. All right. So now I'm going to uh, evaluate this. So now a is just a constant, which means uh, it can be factored out because the derivative is homogeneous. And then what's the derivative of the exponential? e to the kt. And if this were exactly t, we'd be done, but it's not. It's kt. And as a result, what must we do? Multiply by, they use the chain rule and multiply by derivative of kt. So this would be a multiplied by exponential of kt. And then for the chain rule, multiplied by the derivative with respect to t of kt. And then this, this right-hand side is already finished. OK, and then what's the derivative of kt? Just k. OK, and then now all we have to do is ask, uh, is, this, is this equation true? It is, right? because multiplication commutes. OK, so, so I want to sort of uh, stress that this thing is called a differential equation. Uh, and when you solve a differential equation, unlike uh, college algebra, when you're solving an equation in, in college algebra, when you're solving an equation in college algebra, you're looking for a real number, usually. Like maybe the answers are 24 and 14. Okay, you solve a quadratic, and those are the answers. Uh, in this case, this is an equation, and you want to solve, you want to solve it, and what kind of thing is the answer? It's not a number, a function. A function is the answer. That's the kind of thing we're looking for. So, so generally, uh, in, in math, uh, to solve an equation, you know, what the specific kind of thing that you're having to be solving for depends on the context, right? In college algebra, usually you're trying to solve for a real number. In, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in complex variables, sometimes you're trying to solve for a complex number. You know, even sometimes in college algebra, because you want to solve, a, say, a quadratic that has a complex Zero. Okay, but, but in this case, uh, we want to, uh, to solve this equation means to find a function. And what I'm telling you is that this function is the solution, because when you plug it in, the equation is true. Good. Any question about it? So now, uh, right here, right here uh, there's a, actually a bit of a lie. And uh, the lie is that, um, that uh, population, human population, in fact, doesn't grow this way. Uh, if it did, we'd all be in serious trouble. Uh, the, the reason is because uh, in just a few, uh, in just a few, you know, more decades, we'd all like literally be shoulder to shoulder, right? There wouldn't be any room for even one more of us. Uh, we you know, just cover the earth, and uh, and in, and if if population kept growing, then you know the earth itself would be growing, and eventually it would all collapse as a big black hole. Not too many centuries from now. <laughs> Yeah, that's, yeah. Well, no, even if, even if people are dying. <laughs> you know, if, if it was just the case that population really grew that way. 
but it doesn't, right? So uh, what actually happens uh, with humans and uh, in anything is that uh, the environment can actually only support so many uh, creatures, right? So then, depending on our technology level, at the current technology level, the Earth is suspected to be able to, to support, uh, you know, probably on the order of like uh, maybe 30 billion humans. Like we, we, we can't get any more than that it, unless there's technological progress made. Okay, we'll just run out. We'll, we'll make too much heat. We'll make too many waste products. Uh, we just won't be able to have enough, pe uh, un enough resources to do it. So the, the, when, when you have a situation like that, the amount of resources that uh, can be brought to bear for a population uh, and, the, and the, the population that can be carried, that's uh, re referred to as the carrying capacity. So how much, how much, can, you, uh, how much can you do? So the exponential model It's called the exponential model, by the way. I don't think I, I think I've neglected to mention it. It's called the exponential model because the solution is the exponential function, <laughs> by the way. Uh, <clears throat> the exponential model uh, there's kind of three possibilities for how it looks. It's either going to look, uh, it's either going to look like this. So as as time progresses, going like that. So an example would uh, be exponential decay. Uh, well, no, that's what that is. But uh, uh, an example of that would be radioactive decay. So this is uh, k is negative. Uh, and, uh, here's here's a boring one. So what's that one? <laughs> That's uh, k is zero. That would be like uh, you know if you just take a if you just uh, took a proton, you know, and just looked at it forever. Uh, you know, you check. You know, every billion years you check. Yep, still a proton. You know, boring. Uh, then, if k is positive, uh, then it looks like you know like this. So that's the exponential model. Uh, now, if human population. Uh, at least at the present time, kind of is doing this a little bit. But it can't do this forever because, like I said, we'd eventually be shoulder to shoulder and there like, just literally wouldn't be room for even one more of us. Okay, so what, what really happens uh, uh, when you look at uh, populations is something else, uh, wh what's actually observed, and it's called the logistical model or logistic model. So what, uh, what actually happens concerning that? Is that, uh, you know, if, it, if you know, the current estimates are correct and if our technological level is uh, held constant, then uh, the Earth can support 30 billion humans. And, and, and supposing that never changes, and of course it will change, but supposing momentarily that it doesn't change, uh, what, hap what will happen to such a population is that uh, it will be small and then it will grow and it'll look exponential for a while. So it's going up quite rapidly, in fact, more or less proportional to its size. And then it, uh, then it slows down and levels off to uh, the carrying capacity. So uh, this, this curve, this kind of curve, is called a logistic curve. And uh, notably, it goes through a point of inflection. Okay, right there. Uh, besides populations uh, exploding and then coming to their uh, to the environmental carrying capacity, that's a that's a prototypical example. But another example uh, of this that uh, you probably have seen, since you're uh, most of you are at least uh, sophomores, is that uh, you saw something like this in chemistry. What is this? It's a, titra a titration curve. In the end, the reason why that's happening is because, uh, is because when, you, when you introduce these molecules uh, to each other, they're all basically very rapidly able to, uh, to uh, meet each other and react. Okay? And uh, so the reaction you know, proceeds, uh, uh, can be you know, quite slow. And then you start more or less like running out of, uh, say, the buffer. And then uh, it starts exploding, and then it levels off. Okay? Good. So. Uh, let's come up with the, well, let's talk about uh, 
the um, the uh, this model. So suppose that we have a population p and a capacity capacity m. So like in the Earth example, we're talking about 30 billion. Then uh, the logistic model is this, that uh, the population will change in time. The population will change in time, and uh, it will be this. So kp. Now, if I was to stop writing right there, that would be exactly the exponential model, right? If I, if I wrote nothing more. And then now I'm going to multiply that by 1 minus uh, p over m. Okay, so <clears throat> now let's consider this for a moment. Uh, there's kind of, what I want you to see here is that, uh, is that uh, if I consider just, just the left part of the curve, it kind of looks exponential. Okay, and then if I just consider uh, that part of the curve, in fact, it looks exponential, but uh, turned upside down, right? So it's, uh, it's, you know, I could just reflect this up and it's sort of like that. So what I want you to see is that this is in some sense kind of like gluing together two exponential curves. Okay, so that you go from one asymptote to another. Uh, now, the, the reason for that behavior is, quite frankly, uh, because of the product of, of these two factors. So now let's consider. Uh, there's basically two regimes, the regime on the left and the regime on the right. So when the current population, and now I'm going to write this symbol. Okay, uh, what that what that is interpreted to mean is that when the population is much less than the carrying capacity. So an example would be something like right now. You know, the, if the carrying capacity of the Earth is 30 billion and we're at seven and a half, we're it's not necessarily like much much less, but it's it, there's a lot of room to go. Okay, when that's the case. Uh, so when that, then how about, uh, how about uh, this ratio, p over m? When p is very small compared to m, then that means that this thing is close to zero, right? Then p over m, you know, is approximately zero. Not exactly, obviously, but approximately. Uh, and, therefore, 1 minus p over m is, is approximately how much? Approximately 1. So, if that thing in round parentheses is 1, then, you know, that, that kind of is more or less the behavior. And what is that? That's the exponential model. So what it's saying is that uh, when the population is much less than the carrying capacity, at first, the growth looks exponential. All right. So when p is approximately the same size as m, when that's the case, okay, and that can mean exactly m or you know just near, nearly m, then how about that ratio? Right. Then p over m is uh, is uh, close to one. close to one, and then uh, how about that, uh, that factor there? It's close to zero. So, and uh, one minus p over m is close to zero. So that would mean that, uh, you know, that's sort of saying that uh, it's gonna level off. But uh, now I want, you, I want you to consider a, uh, uh, a slight algebraic variation of this. So if I take uh, dp dt, equal to, to that. Uh, what do I need to do? Let's think about this for just a second. I want to get this m to come out. I want to get this m to come out. What do I need to do to get it out? So I'll say that this is kp multiplied by making a common denominator, that would be what, m minus p over m, like that. 
And then now I'm going to get this, uh, I'm going to move this M out so that this is uh, KP over M and then multiplied by uh, M minus P. So viewing it like this, if we're in the case when P is approximately M, then that ratio is 1, and that means that uh, now, now the, the model is K multiplied by M minus P. So the difference between how far we have to go okay, and uh, where we currently are. So that's like uh, an example of that is the, the heating model, right? Stuff, the, the heat of an object changes in proportion to the difference of the surrounding. So the logistic model is like gluing together two exponential models. This is actual population. So for an interesting historical perspective, uh, you might uh, read, out, uh, read about uh, someone named Thomas Malthus. Th Thomas Malthus, who, uh, who predicted that uh, the Earth is going to end soon because uh, we're all going to be shoulder to shoulder. <laughs> and there's such a thing called a Malthusian catastrophe, but it won't happen. Good. So any questions so far? We're okay? All right. So now uh, we have an idea. Uh, so something like, uh, something like the following. So suppose we have something like this. If we say, uh, to make it abstract now, dy dx is uh, equal to uh, x plus y. Okay. So uh, I don't want you to solve this. Rather, I want you to try and think about uh, what this means. What is it, what is it saying? So in particular, uh, if we had, uh, a, if w y could be written as a function of x, we'd be saying that, uh, that the slope, the slope of that function, should be the sum of the x and y coordinates. That's what that's saying, right? The slope should be the sum. All right. So, uh, having given such an example, So, uh, for example, right, uh, right there at the origin, the x and y coordinates are 0, 0. So what should the slope be there? It should be 0, right? It should be 0. There, the coordinates are 0 and 1. So what should the slope be? 1. one. So I'm going to make a little mark that's at uh, slope 1. And then how about there? What should the slope be? 2, two right? So I'm going to make something that's... It's now slope 2. And then the next one would be slope 3, right? Even more slopey. OK, what about, uh, what about that point right there, 1, 1? So its slope should be 2 there, right? So it should look, uh, you know, something like that. How about uh, right there, slope 3? <coughs> so something like, uh, like that, OK, et cetera. How about uh, at 1, 2, slope 3? All right. How about uh, how about that that point at one zero? Slope one. And at there it should be uh, at two zero it'll be slope two. And uh, at there it'll be slope three. Okay. How about right there at uh, at uh, what is that? Uh, three one. So it'll be slope four. So you know it's getting pretty steep right there. All right, how about right here at negative one, zero? <clears throat> slope one. 
slope will be negative 1. Okay, and then at negative 2, 0, it'll be negative 2. And at negative 3, 0, it'll be negative 3. Okay, and uh, at, uh, at negative 1, 1, what will it be? Zero. Zero, so that's interesting. So we could do a bunch of them, right? So like, how about uh, negative 2, 2? Ah, right? So that, you know, like that one right there and like that. Okay, so then how about uh, right there at negative uh, 1, 2? One. Slope 1, right? So is this boring? Yes. Are we going to do it? Yes. Okay. I, I was getting the sense that uh, you thought I was uh, just r rambling. Uh, so negative 2, 1. Negative 1, right? Uh, so in fact, uh, some of those are pretty easy, right? So we should, uh, you know, for example, at uh, negative, uh, uh, what, negative 3, 2, it'd also be 1, right? No, or negative 1, I mean to say. So like that, right, like that, you know? And then this one would be going like that, and like that. You see it? And then uh, that'll, in fact, uh, go this way too, right? So like, uh, like this. So that's neat. So we're kind of, you know, finding some patterns here. Okay, where, where will the zeros be? Parallel to it, right? Parallel. So like uh, right there, and there, and there, and there, and there, and there, and there. Okay, and then how about uh, like that one right there? What will that one be? One. So one, one, one. Okay, and then now look. So that one's at slope two, two, two. So I should be able to do slope two for all of these. Slope two. Slope 2, slope 2. So you can kind of see that uh, you, could, you could, you know, in principle, fill this all up. It'd be really tedious, right, because there's a, what? There's a hundred of them. Okay, but in principle, you could do it. Now, here's the deal. What that slope is telling you, that's telling you how uh, you should move, right? So if you have a function, <coughs> uh, interpreting a function physically, a function is uh, telling you, in, in some sense, where you are position. Its derivative is telling you what? Yeah, where you're going, how you move. So, so if I was to say, I'm thinking of a function that has this behavior, and uh, moreover, moreover, I tell you that uh, I happen to know that, I don't know the function, uh, but I happen to know the value of the function at a particular point. So suppose I know that. Uh, so suppose I know Uh, that uh, when uh, x is equal to 0, y is equal to 1. Suppose we know that. So I could plot a point. That means that uh, that point right there has got to be on the curve. And now the idea is that, uh, well, let's just kind of follow, uh, follow the direction that we would go. So if I started moving to the right, then, then what would happen? Would I be, have to go up or down? I'd have to go up, right? Because that's what the slopes are saying. It's saying, if I go to the right, uh, in the end, I'd have to like, somehow start going up. What about if I go to the left? I'm going to have to go down just a little bit, but not too much. Why? Well, because right there, at that point, the slope is 0, right? Because that's negative half, negative, uh, positive half. Adding, adding them together, the slope would be zero. So we're going to go down a little bit, and then what? And then we're going to have to follow this. So we'd go down a little bit, and then have to start following. Okay, and if you were to do this, you know, it would go up. So this is giving you an idea. How should this function look? So this red thing that we're talking about, it's called a slope field. Okay. Uh, in the end, math, uh, math and physics have this idea that uh, when you've got a grid and you, you start putting a thing at every point, uh, it's whatever kind of thing that is field. So like we're putting slopes everywhere here, so this is called a slope field. If we were putting little vectors, then it would be a vector field. And uh, if we were putting just regular old numbers, that is to say scalars, then it would be a scalar field, and if we put strawberries everywhere, it would be a <laughs> strawberry field. 
got one. Okay, so now you might think uh, I'm not really sure how useful all that is. How could a how could a slope field actually be that uh, that interesting? Uh, well, well, uh, I have something under here. Okay, and uh, here I have a, a thing. So I'm holding it still. So can you see that uh, that uh, little r red and blue thing there? See how when I move it around, it's uh, kind of moving? So like, I could, uh, you know, if I could plot in space, that is to say in, in space, I put little slopes, I could like say, okay, slope there, and then, you know, record that, and then there, record, 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 record. Okay, that, that would be something potentially interesting to look at. Of course, what am I obscuring here? Magnet. A magnet, right? And uh, this, the, the purpose of this is you know, to tell you, to let you play with and understand uh, the direction of the magnetic field. So I'm obscuring a magnet there. And then to, to help uh, even more, perhaps. Okay, so then there's a... There's a some particular slope field. Okay, it's just some old slope field. Looks uh, not that interesting. Okay, so then twisting it that way doesn't seem to do much. That's interesting. But if I, uh, you know, if I do this, okay, what if I twist it this way? Oh, interesting. If I twist it that way. It does that. And if you're watching these, those little pieces, uh, they're spinning around. They're going uh, clockwise. And if I spin it the other way, they'll go counterclockwise. And if I turn it like that and then do this, you know, they do something you know, slightly different. By the way, this is how, uh, how we generate electricity. Right? We just heat stuff up, and that causes water to heat, which causes it to expand into steam which we use to turn a turbine, and connected to that turbine is a magnet, <laughs> a big one, and it just twists. Interesting. So, slope fields. Okay, they tell you, uh, you know, you could trace out the magnetic field lines of this by, you know, sort of just following these around. Interesting. So, any questions about that? Okay with it? All right. So <clears throat> now uh, that feature uh, that we were looking at, if we were to plot very carefully and patiently uh, this one that we were working on, okay, you'd see uh, that one right there. So they took the time to give us one. So you can kind of see, ah, we've got that, uh, we've got that straight line right there. Okay, that's uh, for us, it's right there. So what would happen if uh, we started a point that was, uh, that, that was in fact exactly on that line? Then what would, what would we do from there? Stay on we'd stay on it forever, we'd never, we'd never leave. Interesting. All right. <clears throat> so that's a, a, a neat curiosity. So uh, any any question about that? So now, if I gave you uh, a uh, a different differential equation, come on. Say, for example, like this one, uh, say dy dx is equal to, uh, instead of x plus y, how about uh, x minus y? You know, then you could plot it carefully. You could plot the slope field, okay, and you could find those lines. It would have its own uh, lines. Okay, but we don't have enough time to do another one, but uh, you're going to you're going to end up having homework where, where you do it. We don't have time to do it in class. And then do we have anything else to mention? 
No, that's it for today. All right, so I'll see y'all tonight. Uh, good luck.